The, yeah, so the question is, is it because children, res uh, young children respond better to parent training? Now, they didn't pre-treat them with parent training. Okay. They, they delivered this concurrently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I was saying is that when you look, uh, you compare a study of parent training with preschoolers and parent training, even when they're still young, like six, seven, eight-year-olds, uh, you, you get better effect sizes when you do preschool parent training interventions. So moving on to lit review for the six years and older, uh, we have 76 records identified through this database search stra strategy that I used, and then four records that I found through secondary sources. Uh, I ended up looking at 17 uh, full text records, and I excluded some that were interesting, but not kind of to the point. I wanted to stay focused on updating our current guidelines, so those were like breakfast conditions or some open label comparisons or an interesting paper on iron deficiency. What I did include were um, four cardiac safety studies, um, three comparative effectiveness studies, uh, three single agent uh, trials, two combination regimen trials, and one open label study that I brought in just because I thought it was, it was particularly relevant. So it's a little bit like the Christmas song, but we're not starting at 12, we're starting at four. And the, so for cardiac safety studies, I, I think those are important uh, as we get our informed consent uh, and inform families about expected risks. So we have basically three studies that came out that use population-based retrospective cohort studies and then a prospective randomized clinical trial with a naturalistic uh, follow-up. And the first one would be the, and, and let me, um, emphasize the, these studies all used uh, the outcomes of stroke, MI, sudden cardiac death, and ventricular arrhythmias, so severe cardiovascular uh, outcomes. And in the prospective randomized controlled trial, blood pressure and pulse were the outcomes. So the first one here would be the Cooper study, um, and this captures children in Medicaid, HMOs, and commercial insurance. So it's a mixture, you might say, of, of SES um, that's represented here and included ages two to 24 years. About 1.2 million uh, are, um, youth are, are included in these uh, studies and they got a 2.5 million follow-up years that they could look at in that large data set, they had 81 events, 81 cases that had one of these outcomes, which led to an incident rate of 3.1 per 100,000. And then when they um, took into account whether or not there had been stimulant exposure, it turned out that you did not have a difference in risk, the odds ratio for current stimulant use against no use um, overall was 0.75, uh, but this risk, uh, this odds ratio spanned one, you know, so here you have a number 0 0.3 to 1.85, so it means it could be either lower or it could be higher, so it's a non-significant um, odds ratio, but in the direction that if anything, being on a stimulant would lower the risk. We can't say that it does because it's a non-significant ratio. Now, where it gets uh, uh, interesting is that the Winterstein study, uh, similar sample size, 1.2 million. This one is only Medicaid-insured children, ages 3 to 18. Also, closely uh, uh, about the same amount of uh, follow-up person follow-up years, and. What's unique about this study is they also included uh, children that had pre-existing cardiac issues, cardiac risk problems. Uh, and so they found a total of 66 cases, and 26 of them were in their high risk group. So they had overall an incident of 2.8 per 100,000. So that's quite similar to what was found by the Cooper study. However, in that high risk group, it was 63 per 100,000. 
um, their adjusted odds ratio for stimulant use, similarly to the Cooper study, also was not significantly affected by stimulant exposure. And that the same held in the high risk group. So in, in both cases, we see that the estimate, the odds ratio goes from less than one to above one. Um, we see that if we had a child that had a pre-existing cardiac condition, they're, they're at more risk for one of these outcomes, undesirable outcomes, but that is by virtue of them having a pre-existing risk. So adding the stimulant exposure in this observational study did not increase um, the risk. And, and um, somewhat similar, but they used a different approach, so we don't get quite the same estimates. Smaller sample size, also Medicaid and commercial, same age, three to 17. They did not report the, the person follow-up year and they could not calculate an incident rate because they actually didn't get incidents in ADHD medication users. So even with a sample size of nearly a quarter million children, they did not get these incidents here. So it gives you an idea of how large of a sample size you need if you really wanted to find these effects that concern us so much, and I think rightfully so, uh, but th they also did not, they, they said basically we, we can't estimate a risk for a stroke and MI in, in our data set. Moving to the, the Vitiello study um, that basically looked at participants uh, of the MTA study, which you remember they enrolled at ages seven to nine, were followed for 10 years. Um, their incident, incidents were reported as one suicide in this group, one death by motor vehicle accident, and one unexplained death. Um, kind of their bottom line summary is that they did not find if stimulant effects on either systolic or diet, diastolic blood pressure, um, and that stimulants did not increase risk for tachycardia, but at the same time, cumulative exposure was associated with the higher pulse, i.e. you had small, very small increases um, of pulse rate at follow-up years three and, and eight. So I would conclude from that that we currently can say treatment with stimulants not associated with increased short-term risk of severe cardiovascular events. We cannot generalize this to long-term use and that the stimulants did not increase risk of hypertension but were associated with a, a heart rate effect and that we don't really know the long-term effects of these slight increases in, in pulse and blood pressure. In the three comparative effectiveness studies, I'm, I'm including two meta-analyses and one direct uh, clinical study. The meta-analysis include a meta-analysis of comparative effectiveness and acceptability uh, comparing methylphenidate and atomoxetin. For this uh, analysis, they included nine randomized studies. Five of them were double blind and four of them were open label studies. Um, and again, I was surprised. <laughs> uh, here they're reporting non-significant differences methyl for methylphenidate and atomoxetin. Um, no significant differences for immediate release methylphenidate uh, and atomoxetin. And then they refer to a subgroup analysis uh, that takes the ORUS methylphenidate, uh, where they're finding a small difference in favor of um, the ORUS methylphenidate. No differences in response rate overall, which is really, that was kind of different from what I had tucked away from previous results, uh, basically saying you, you have uh, comparable response rates and also discontinuation rates not different. So in terms of acceptability, if you're taking stopping a medication as a, a measure of is this is an acceptable treatment, no difference in the studies that they reviewed. Now I, I took their I took their table and added a few little stars to it to, to say, okay, so where is the subgroup uh, 
reference to, to Oros methylphenidate coming from, and it's coming from one um, double-blind trial here, and then the rest is coming from these open-label studies. So that might be something we want to keep in mind um, because I'd say the evidence is stronger when it comes from a randomized controlled trial and that would give us a small uh, advantage, a small favor uh, for methylphenidate uh, with a standardized mean difference of 0.19, which is quite small. Uh, but I, I, I guess what I took away from that personally uh, uh, is I might have to really change my informed consent talk uh, when I speak about atomoxetin, and I wanted to bring that to your attention and see if, uh, if you think that ha should have any impact on our guidelines. The, the other meta-analysis was a, was a different one, whereas this one was head-to-head -head comparisons of methylphenidate and atomoxetin, um, th this was a, a comparison that was done taking studies that assessed methylphenidate and studies that assessed amphetamine in double-blind placebo-controlled trials, uh, but then basically doing the comparison by comparing the effects that were reported in non-head-on studies. Um, the evaluated... Um, Amphetamine against placebo in, um, in a smaller group of participants than methylphenidate against placebo had a total of 99 study level um, comparisons, which were mostly for total ADHD symptoms, a few that focused, that provided inattention ratings, and 17 that provided separate hyperactivity impulsivity rating. So, yeah, in, the, in this uh, Ferron study, they, um, they identified a potential, um, th that potentially amphetamine products may be moderately more efficacious, but I also saw a really um, nice review of this meta-analysis that was pointing out that they, of course, we already know, it lacks the direct comparison, uh, but they also hadn't done what you just were uh, referring to, like really assessing the quality uh, and the validity of each individual study that they had included there. So um, I, I, for completeness, I, I wanted to bring this in here. And then here we have a, a, a direct study, dose effects and comparative effectiveness of uh, extended release uh, uh, dexmethylphenidate and extended release uh, um, amphetamine salts. This is a study that involved 56 children in an eight-week double-blind crossover trial. In there was one week of randomized placebo in there, and they gave sequential doses of um, 10, 20, and 25 to 30, depending on the weight of the child. So children under 35 kilograms only got the 25 <coughs> dose. Um, and they randomized them 50-50 to one or the other, you know, and then there, was a, then there was a switch and there was a randomized placebo week in there, but otherwise followed a, a sequential progression of these, of these doses. And found that both drug classes were associated with significant symptom reductions and that it was really the dose level rather than drug class uh, that, that uh, predicted a um, medication response. Now, I'm coming at this from the perspective, we're, we're basically saying start with a stimulant, either this or that. Are we at a point where we have more comparative effectiveness data that would lead us one way or the other? Doesn't really hint in this direction, but importantly, I think they, they are finding in their small study, 38% showed no positive response to either of these two drugs. Uh, 36 positive response to both, and then they had 15 that had a preferential response. Like there was eight that, that responded to one and not the other, and seven that responded the other way around. So I, I think we're at a point still where we need to leave this open and, uh, and allow that you have a trial with one. If that doesn't work, switch to, the, switch to an alternative stimulant.
and this is the this is their um, their efficacy data as far as uh, safety. I'm following the format that was used for the AHRQ uh, review, which I think is very useful. They're basically saying, hey, how many uh, had to discontinue the study because of adverse events? That would be six had to uh, discontinue. They don't really tell us what led to a discontinuation. They had one SAE in the study, remember that was 56 children, one severe adverse event. And the most common side effects were insomnia, loss of appetite, irritability, nail biting, expected stimulant side effects, and no vital sign or EKG differences. 